I was daydreaming. You ever do that? Probably shouldn't do it when I'm supposed to speak. Amen? At any rate, um, God's good. We're going to uh, talk on a topic, I think, today that's really near and dear to, I think, most of our hearts. Thank you for being here today. All of you joining us online, thank you for joining us online. I pray that you have a, a great moment of connecting with the Lord, whether you're here in person or whether you're joining us via that kind of media uh, connection. So we're in week five of our series already, Grown Up Faith. Each week now, for several weeks, we're going through what I would call an intensive spiritual workout. We're doing that by addressing a certain question and then looking deeply into that implications it has in our lives. I pray you're ready to do a spiritual workout uh, this morning. I want to begin by asking you some questions. Are you a trusting person? I think our culture is teaching us to not be trusting, right? Would you say that you trust that God truly and earnestly loves you, that he unconditionally loves you? Do you trust that God has the best interests in mind for your life and for your existence? Do you trust that God can deliver on his promises? Our question that we're going to deal with today in this message is this, can I trust God? Can I trust God? Now, part of the benefit of knowing the big picture of the Bible, knowing what it's all about, that it's one big story, is that it lends itself then to trustworthiness. We tend to say, okay, God has a plan. I see what he's up to. I see where I, where I fit into that plan. And that instills into us a, a measure of trust we otherwise wouldn't have. Here's what we see from God's picture of the Bible from this big picture individually. And this is our big thought for the message today. God has promised you a bigger life, and you're to trust him for that. Now, when I use the word bigger, I don't mean more prosperous. You got, you know, a Corvette or a Stingray or a Mustang, whatever you like for cars. You get all that kind of, get that stuff out of your mind. What God invites us into when I say bigger is a more real, authentic experience in him, understanding what life is really about, knowing who we are, knowing who God is, and understanding all the significance of, of that kind of thing. Now, often the real question that we are asking is, it, it, behind the question, can I trust God, is this. Can I trust God to do the things in my life I read about in the Bible all the time? Can I trust God to do that in my own life? That often is the question within the question, can I trust God? So today we're going to look into this question, can I trust God? Um, one of the benefits of going through the Bible, like Pastor Aaron and I did with you, uh, when it comes to the Gospel of John for 29 weeks, we went through the Gospel of John for, for that long of a time, is you begin to see big themes, big principles. And one of the things I noticed in the Gospel of John is this, that Jesus, whenever somebody ran into Jesus, it was greater than they expected. In fact, it wasn't even on their radar what he was going to do in their lives. He always invited people into something bigger and grander than they could imagine or hope for. And I think that whole thought process, that whole experience, that whole uh, gospel of, of, of John is summarized in John 10.10 10, where Jesus says, I've come to give you life and life to the full. That in a, in a phrase is, is what happens when you run into the Lord Jesus Christ. And what Jesus says frequently in the New Testament is often illustrated in Old Testament characters, and such is the case when it comes to this idea that God invites us into something bigger than we could do ourselves. And we're going to use this old example of Abraham, Old Testament example of Abraham, as a great uh, illustration of God doing something bigger than could be imagined. So Abraham is known as the father of faith. Quite a label, isn't it? Let's look at his story for a few moments, learn what we can from him about trust, see how he illustrates that for us and hopefully come away from today's message kind of worked out and, and, and getting our trust muscle, so to speak, in, in shape. So I'm going to begin by reading to you Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Listen to this. Now the Lord said to Abram, who's Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and in him who, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So basically, God comes into Abraham's life, and he, and he gives him three big promises. One, I'm going to bring you to a great land, Abraham. Secondly, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. 
Thirdly, he says to Abraham, from you will come a great Messiah, someone who will bless all people. It's so interesting to, that the Bible doesn't say, now Abraham, he was discontent with his life, you know, he hit the midlife crisis, he didn't know it, what on earth am I here for, and he's going through all this, you know, angst and, and looking for God. No, God shows up in Abraham's life and says, I got something bigger for you, buddy, than you can imagine. Isn't that how Jesus works in our life today? We often don't even know what we don't even know. We come to Christ not knowing how desperately we need Christ. We come to Christ not knowing how messed up we are and how wrong our lives really are. And we get into Jesus and all of a sudden he's doing these things we never even thought we should be doing. Amen? Amen. Come on, give me an amen, please. Amen? amen? He, that's his MO. That's just how he operates. Listen to Abraham's response to God's promises. This is what we're going to dwell on just for a few moments here in this message. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. How old was Abram? Hmm. You are all young in this service. Someone 75? What does that tell you about age when it comes to faithfulness and trusting God? Does it ever end? No. I just want you to hear that. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the Oak of Moriah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I'll give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. So let's talk about Abraham here for a few moments and how he responded to God in a way that I think facilitates trust, all right, in our lives. First of all, we see this. He listened and he went. Abraham listened to God and he went. Can you imagine packing up your family? Some of you have three or four small children right now, don't you? And, you, you know, can, it, anything's hard to do like that. And I can imagine this conversation with his wife, Sarah. Hey, Sarah, we're moving. Really? Where? I don't know. God's going to show us. Men don't like directions. They don't like to read maps. They don't like their wives to tell them where to go. Abraham, of course, took that to an extreme. Amen? We're just going to go. God's going to show up. He's going to tell us where to go. You know, interestingly enough, he models for us what we're called to and how we're supposed to follow God and trust God in the New Testament. Jesus says, I've come to give you life, life to the full. Where am I going, Jesus? I'll show you. I'll show it when it's appropriate. You don't know that yet. I'm not going to show that yet. Because otherwise, it's not a faith, trust, walk, is it? And we're called into the same kind of relationship with God that Abraham illustrates for us here. I've uh, talked to several people that have had to move because of COVID-19. They've lost their jobs or whatever. And uh, it's hard, especially if they're older. I've noticed that the ones in the 50s especially struggle with moving because they thought, I had a plan. I'm going to go here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to retire. I'm going to do this. All of a sudden, I don't have a job. And I, I, the extreme amount of frustration has been verbalized to me. But here's what I got to tell you all. We always, always have an uncertain future, but we always have a certain God. We always know who he is. And, and, and we have to always come to the conclusion that I, I'm willing to, to, to listen to you, God, and go where you want me to go, God, even if I don't understand what's going on. Amen? I know who you are, and I know by following you that you're always going to keep me in the place I should be. I remember years ago when I was called to come back here to Brookings from Williston. Williston was a tough place when I moved there. It was in, in, a, in a bust condition. And I remember going to town and stopping at a gas station. Someone asked me what I was doing. I said, moving to Williston. And she said, why would anybody move here? Thank you. You should be on the welcoming committee for the town. <laughs> Felt like I should come here. I'm glad I made this decision. And, and we went through some really, I would call it, it was almost like a depressed community at the time. It was, it was busted, you know, the oil field had come and gone. And so then it started booming a couple years before I moved back here. And I thought, oh, People are coming to town. Yay, right? And I get to be part of this boom. And then it was like God said, no, you don't. 
And I remember saying, God, surely you don't know what you're doing here. <laughs> I put in a decade. I got all this credibility. People, I can do blah, 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 blah. But it was time to move. And I had to listen. And I had to go. Was it easy? Uh-uh. Oftentimes, listening to God and going where God tells you to go is not easy. But, oh, is it so good? And does it take you to a good place? So how do you do when it comes to listening and going? I just want you to reflect on that. Second thing we see in Abraham is he was fully invested. He took all of his family and possessions. I mean, he went as a caravan. Everything he had went on that journey. He didn't say, hmm, I'm going to put my toe in the water here. Ah, God, I think I'll wait until the... Circumstances are a little bit more favorable before I come and do this kind of thing. I just got to, you know, I got to work a couple more years here, do a couple more things here. You know, he immediately was fully invested in what God wanted him to do. There was no back door. There was full steam ahead. Let me ask you this question. Are you fully invested in Jesus Christ? Are you pushing forward to where he wants you to be in your, in your life? This last thought from uh, Abraham's response really struck a chord in my heart. He went as a worshiper. He went as a worshiper of God, calling on the name of the Lord. He took time to build an altar and call on God. I want to tell you something. Trust is linked intimately to worship. And I'm talking more than some song worship on a Sunday morning, which is good. I like it. I like it. It's good stuff. But trust is so linked to our understanding that we're called to be a worshiper of God. We're to you know, seek him throughout the day in the small things. We're to sing a song in our hearts to him. Uh, if you don't sing very well, hum an off tune. It doesn't matter. You're to, you're to pray. You're to thank him frequently for what he's doing in your life. You're to see him in the beauty of the outdoors. Have you seen the colors lately? They're just gorgeous. I, it's not just old people that should see this. They're, they're, it's, just, it's just magnificent. You'd see some of the color in the majesty of God's creation at times. It should just be, wow, look at this. It's so cool. It, it, we, I see them in the creativity of people. Do you see them in the creativity of people? Sometimes I look at somebody and say, man, you're just so gifted this way. I see the creativity of God in you. And I worship my God. I magnify my God's name. Uh, that, that's worship that instills trust. Worship instills trust. Now, I think it's no stretch to say this. I think if Abraham was on this platform, he would say to us this, God is good. Trust him and trust his ways. Amen? I think if Abraham was up here and given testimony today, he would say, God is good. Trust him and trust his ways. Think about the Old Testament. It's nothing more than detailing out God's faithfulness to this covenant he makes with Abraham, that he would be a great people, a great nation, and from him would come a great Messiah. That's the rest of the Old Testament. It's just flashing out this interaction that God had with Abraham. And I know that if Abraham was sitting here today, he would say, God is good. Trust him and trust his ways. But Abraham, like so many of us, experienced what? A delay in the fulfillment of the promises. A year went by, no kid. Two years went by, no kid. He's thinking, okay, how am I going to have all these offspring if I have no kids? He's 75 years old when this all happened. Pretty soon as a decade, nothing's happened. And now we get to Genesis chapter 15. And I love how God reaffirms some things with Abraham. Listen to the scripture from verses 1 through 18. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, oh, Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, this man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look toward the heaven and number the stars if you're able to uh, number them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as what? Righteousness. I'm going to stop there for a moment. This is one of the key verses of the Old Testament, maybe of the Bible. It's an important witness to the doctrine that we're justified by faith. Amen? Amen. We're not justified by works. We're justified by what? Believing God, believing his promises, and acting in a faithful way. It's also, it's also testimony to the unity of the Old Testament 
and the New Testament that we always come to God by faith. It's one big story. God didn't start one way and say, whoops, I messed up. I'm going to change the story. Amen. The Bible is one big story. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, oh Lord, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be soldiers in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring, I'll give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. So the covenant that God makes with Abram. Abram, now remember, Abram's going, what's going on, God? I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Nothing happened. So God shows up again, and he kind of reaffirms everything that's going on, and he says, I'm going to go into covenant with you. Now, the covenant that was made is called a suzerain vassal covenant that was made here. The suzerain means king And vassal means servant. So it's a king-servant covenant. And people at that time, when they were making such a covenant, would kill an animal, separate the halves, and they'd walk through this bloody mess, and they would say to one another, if I don't keep this covenant with you, may this happen to me, what's happened to this animal, and they do what was called the bloody walk. And we see here that, that Abram didn't walk through that. Why? Because he was never able to keep that covenant. God knew that Abram couldn't keep this covenant. So God unilaterally walked through this sacrifice as a, as a smoking pot and a flaming torch, right? Because he knew that Abraham couldn't keep this covenant. And he unilaterally made this covenant with Abraham that you will be a great nation. You will be a great people. And a great Messiah will come from you. This is reflective of the New Testament covenant. God is foreshadowing what he's going to do when he sends his son. His son came to us, and he became the bloody sacrifice. He did the blood walk, so to speak. And God made covenant with us, basically unilaterally, as a great king. And when the great king would make a, a, a covenant with a servant, a vassal, what did he want from the, from the vassal, the servant? Loyalty. And what would the king do? Provide everything for him. But all he asked in return was for faithfulness and loyalty. And so our great king has come to us, Jesus Christ. And what does he ask for us to be in covenant with him? What? Faithfulness and trust. Amen. And he's provided everything else. Pretty good deal. Amen. Wow. I thought I'd get more amens than that, but that's okay. But here's the reality of what Abram was facing. It was a long time before any of this was taking place. And trusting often involves waiting on God's timing. Waiting on God's timing. Well, in the waiting, though, he was the recipient of this profound covenant, though. In the waiting, something profound happened for Abraham. He was the recipient of this covenant. God made a suzerain vassal covenant with Abraham that he would bless him with offspring as numerous as the stars, that his descendants would possess the land. Ultimately, the line of Abraham would lead to Jesus who would bless all people. So he got to be the recipient in the waiting. Now, give me, sometimes, you know, we think it's hard to wait on you, God. It's hard to trust in you so long. But in, sometimes in the trusting, that's when these marvelous revelations come to us. Amen? And our depth of faith grows and our understanding of who God is grows and our dependency on him grows. See, the big life will require trusting God. The big life will require trusting God. So let's talk about how to do that using our grown-up faith language. How do I trust God? I'm going to use our grown-up faith language. First of all, trust your mind to God's truth. Even when the ways of God don't seem to make sense, even when they're inconvenient, even when they're extraordinarily hard, you have to trust the right. You just have to stake that thing in the ground, and you just have to say, God, I trust in your revealed truth. Jesus has told us he'll never leave us or forsake us, right? That's like a revealed truth. 
So what do you do? No matter what you're going through, no matter how lonely you feel, no matter how much you might feel disenfranchised, no matter what your friends are doing, no matter what your parents are saying, or no matter what your kids are doing, you what? You trust Jesus Christ because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Amen? Your mind has to just stake that in the ground and you have to say, my God is always with me no matter what I feel or no matter what I experience. I know my God is with me because that's what his word says and that's what he's promised to me. You stake it in the ground and you trust in that revealed truth. You trust your heart to God's goodness. It's an old exchange we used to do in church, but a preacher like me would say, God is good, what would you say? All the time. And then what would you say after that? God is good. No, you'd say all the time. And I'd say God is good. Can we do that? I'm going I'm to coach you up on this. Some of you look at me, what are you talking about? So I say God is good, you say all the time, then you say all the time, I say God is good. You ready to do that? We'll do that one time. God is good. All the time. And I'll say it again. God is good. Amen. And he is. He is good all the time. We got to trust that God is forever, ever good. We have to trust that God is good in the midst of our problems. We got to trust that he graces with peace in the midst of sorrow. We got to trust that he will comfort our souls. Uh, even in the midst of COVID-19, I don't know about you, I'm so irritated with this stuff now. Every time I get a little bit of a phlegmy thing going, I thought, oh no, COVID-19. Anybody else there? I don't know. Do anybody have allergies besides me? This is like a nightmare fall for allergies. Would you agree with me on this? I think all the Colorado fires and California, all that junk is wafting our direction. We haven't had rain. It's like I walk outside, I just have this visualization of all this junk destroying my ability to breathe. I go outside, I start crying. If you see me crying, it's not because I'm crying. It's just allergies. I golfed the other day. I think I left a gallon of water on the golf course. It wasn't because of missed shots either. It was just kind of just... Anyway, even in the midst of all that, what can we say? God is good. He is good. His goodness should prevail in our hearts. Lastly, trust your will to God's ways. I love how in Acts, which is a book of the early history of the church, it sometimes referred to followers as people of the way. I just, I, I love that word, way. It, the earlier... Early followers of Jesus were known as people of the way. And that had a couple implications. What it meant, first of all, is they knew that the only way to God was through Jesus Christ. And they were fixated on that and settled on that in their mind. But they also were so enamored and so in love with Jesus and so devoted to Jesus that they decided to live their life in the way that he lived his life. So they were simply known as people of the way. I've been praying that we would be people of the way here. That you would be people of the way. That we would have will so aligned with God that we would just love the ways of God, knowing the way to God is through Jesus, and the way to live is by Jesus' instructions. So we're back to the story of Abraham. It's just taken so long for this child to show up. This child of promise. It's 20 years now. So Sarah and Abraham did what I think a lot of us do. When we don't think God has shown up, we take matters into our own hands. And that's what they did. And they had this brilliant idea. Abraham, why don't you have a kid with Hagar, the handmaiden of Sarah? That, I mean, that's a stupid idea. Come on now. I read that. Every time I read it, I go, come on. That's a dumb idea. And that led to nothing but heartache in their, in their uh, family and in history. And then that year 25 guy shows up again to Abraham and says, next year, buddy, you'll have a son of promise. And you know what? After that point, Abraham never wavered. He never wavered one time. He was devoted to God, mind, heart, and will. And when God said to him down the road, offer to me your son of promise, Isaac. He said, I can, believing that God could raise him from the dead. He had moved to this place of, I serve a resurrection God. Does that sound like New Testament language to you? Amen, you should be saying amen. It's one story. Come on now, it's one story. The Bible's one story. It's not like God was making this up as he's going along. He's known this, he's known this story since the foundation of the world. Amen? amen? So let's go to one last thought here, this principle. The deeper you trust in all three of these areas, mind, heart, and will, the more grown up your faith in your faith you will become. And that's what we see in Abraham. He modeled that for us. And I want to end by reading to you um, a part of this book by Kevin Myers called Grown Up Faith. It's um, where I'm getting some of the material for this, uh, the messages. But again, he's talking about this big picture and understanding all the implications and it just fits into the message really well today. Listen to this. Myers says this, 
By now you're probably starting to get a better handle on the bigger picture of the Bible. You can see how it is God's story of redemption for humankind. God gave us a place in paradise with him, but we rejected him because we didn't trust him. We tried to assert our independence and make our own way, but we couldn't succeed without him. So God gave us a way forward. When God made the covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15 with the animal carcasses and smoking fire pot, he promised Abraham a bigger, better life. The rest of the Old Testament describes how God's chosen people responded to that covenant. But the, the ceremony of the carcasses also foreshadows the coming of Jesus Christ. God promised to spill his own blood to make good on the contract. And in a very real sense, he did that through Jesus on the cross. That's why Jesus' death and resurrection is the central event in human history and sits at the apex of the triangle. You may be wondering when the trust um, test ends. This is what I want you to hear now. The answer is never. Amen? You always are called to trust God. You cannot escape the need to trust God, nor will we ever outgrow it. God wanted our dependence in the garden. He wanted our dependence when he prepared to flood the earth. He wanted our dependence when we were building towers to our own fame. He wanted it even as he offered us his covenant, and he still wants it. Growing up faith grows in dependence and trust. It never graduates beyond it. Let's pray, and then we're going to do some baptisms. Would you bow your heads, please? Lord God, I want to thank you for today and for this opportunity to do some baptisms. I want to thank you for this wonderful story of Abraham and how he illustrates for us trust. Jesus, I want to thank you that basically you've called us to a trust walk in you. And then the Bible and great stories like Abraham and other patriarchs and other New Testament characters just fleshes that out, just illustrates it out for us. So I pray we'd be people of deep trust in you, Jesus. That we would go we'd listen and go, that we would invest totally in you, Lord, that we'd understand there's no back door, there's no backing out, Lord, that we'd follow you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, Lord. I I just pray too, Lord Jesus, that, um, that we would be people of the way, just people who are following after you, Jesus, and following after your ways hard. God, I pray that as we go, we'd worship, like even now, we're gonna sing a song. It can be a time when we just check out mentally and just, ah, Or it could be a time when we connect with you. And as we connect with you and we get intimate with you and we worship you, Lord, I'm convinced we become more and more um, a person of deep trust in you. So grace us, Lord, to be followers that are, you know, illustrative of the way that's talked about in the book of Acts. That we just trust you wholeheartedly and follow hard after you, Lord God. We love you, Lord. We praise you. And all God's people said,